I guess you felt you had to make it right. Lisa settled tighter in her seat, looking out the window. They were already out of the college campus and moving down the highway. Lisa and her husband, Mike Lars, had just dropped their youngest child, Samantha, off at a new school. In just two weeks, they had gone from a full house to empty nesters. It was a bittersweet feeling, but exciting at the same time. Mike and Lisa met in their sophomore year of college, and Lisa fell desperately in love with him. They were inseparable for the next two years and married the summer before their senior year. Mike was in a five-year program to get his MBA, so Lisa found a job teaching at a small private school while Mike finished his senior year. As soon as he graduated, they moved to Mike's hometown, where Mike took a job at his father's small company as a production manager. Mike's first paycheck didn't take long to arrive. Their son, Joshua, was born six weeks after Mike started his new job. The young couple was thrilled with their son and were the picture of a happy young family. Two years later, Samantha joined them. Everything was perfect. Lisa stayed home until Samantha went to school. Then she returned to the classroom, accepting a position as a fourth-grade teacher in the same district as her children. Lisa enjoyed working with children, and it helped her fill the days while the children were in school. Her father-in-law owned a small manufacturing shop. When Mike graduated from high school, the elder Lars was a wonderful engineer who produced high-quality specialty parts for a variety of industries, including space applications. Their niche was low-volume production with high quality at good unit costs. Low volume meant higher unit costs, but Lars Manufacturing regularly beat their competitors on quality, even at a higher price. Mike and his father formed a great team. If John Lars was an excellent engineer, he was not an experienced businessman. Mike knew enough about engineering to reason intelligently but did not inherit his father's gift and passion. However, Mike was an excellent businessman. Mike handled sales, negotiations, and supply chain management, leaving his father free to design and invent. Mike was able to keep prices down while John maintained quality. Together, they turned Lars Manufacturing into a leader in its niche. Six years ago, tragedy struck when John Lars suffered a massive stroke and died at his desk. He was only 55 years old, but he was overweight and a smoker. He loudly proclaimed that eating and smoking helped him focus on his projects. That may have been true, but it probably cost him his life. Mike took full control of the business and hired three young engineers to take John's place. Two of these engineers were competent workers, but the third, Tony Gillis, showed the same creative spark as John. After two years, Tony was appointed director of engineering and formed almost the same partnership that Mike had with his father. The biggest difference was that John and Mike were family and shared the responsibility of owning the company. Now that John was gone, Mike became the full owner of the company. This resulted in Mike working longer hours and traveling more than before. Lisa looked at her husband. In his 40s, Mike still looked good. He had learned from his father's example. His dark hair was lightly touched with gray, and he kept himself in shape. Never a runner, Mike favored water sports like whitewater rafting and scuba diving to stay active. Lisa never liked to get wet but enjoyed lying in the boat while Mike and their two children took dives. Not that Lisa let herself go. Long hours at the gym doing Pilates, Zumba, and yoga kept her in great shape. Lisa's trim figure, B-cup breasts, and toned body attracted attention wherever she went. As a fourth-grade teacher, Lisa was popular with fathers at back-to-school nights. That the kids went straight off to college was a surprise. Josh graduated third in his class and was accepted into the same engineering school his grandfather had attended. This school emphasized internships and had students complete three six-month internships over the course of a five-year program. Josh would finish the five-year program with a master's degree in nuclear engineering if he stayed on track while his grandfather had focused on practical engineering. Josh wanted something a little brighter, but Josh wasn't a surprise. It turned out to be Samantha. Sam had graduated a full two years early and had edged out her older brother for second place in their graduating class. Josh just laughed and was proud of his little sister. Sam had studied incredibly hard the last three years to graduate early, and he said she deserved it. 
Josh had, however, teased her a bit for missing out on the valedictorian spot, a scholastic title awarded to the highest achieving student in an academic institution's graduating class, because of a B-plus in art class. Now, Sam was starting a pre-med and molecular biology program at an Ivy League school. Lisa was happy for her daughter but saddened that she would not get to see Sam attend a traditional high school. Lisa was a little biased but was confident that her daughter, at 18, would be a sure winner in the battle for the title of prom queen. They had grown a little distant over the past few years, and part of Lisa wished she had those two years to rebuild her relationship with Sam. Without saying a word, Lisa turned and looked out the window again. Things were going to be very different now. The next few weeks would be hard on everyone, but it had to happen. Any regrets? Mike asked. Lisa sighed, a few, but I'll live with them. It's time for a new chapter in our lives. Mike laughed. You make it sound like we're dying. Hell, with instant messaging and Skype, it'll be almost as if the kids never left. That's true, Lisa agreed. For the next four hours of the drive, Lisa and Mike carried on the casual conversations of a long-married couple, neighbor gossip, chores, and other mundane things. Today was Thursday, and Mike had taken Friday off to do some chores around the house, so Lisa was downloading a list of things to do. Finally, they arrived home, and Mike parked the minivan in its nest in the garage. Normally, a three-car garage held their two-year-old minivan, Mike's Camry, and the 2013 Corvette that Mike had bought himself. The vet was a point of contention for Lisa. Mike had just shown up with it one night two years ago without saying a word to her. Mike said it was a gift from the company that had signed the largest contract by far with a major NASA contractor. Technically, it belonged to the company, so Lisa had little cause for complaint. The kids liked it right away. As soon as the van was parked, Lisa dragged her slightly aching body out of it. Eight hours in the car today, hauling all of Sam's stuff to her dorm and the tumultuous lovemaking the night before, had Lisa dying to take a hot shower and get into bed. I need to go get some milk, Mike said, also getting out of the minivan. Lisa groaned. Why didn't you stop on the way here? Their house was ten minutes out of town, and they had passed two stores after getting off the highway. You looked like you needed to get home, and I didn't mind, Mike replied. Lisa felt a small bubble of gratitude for Mike's attentiveness. At times, he was such a good man. I'll take the vet, Mike said. It's a gorgeous evening, and it's much more fun to drive than this minivan. Lisa waved him off. No sooner had Lisa entered the house than Mike was already in the car and pulling out of the garage with a roar of the V8. He drove off. Lisa went up to her room and undressed to take a shower. She felt like she was missing something. Mike was such a great guy in so many ways, he was the perfect husband and father. But soon, he would be gone, and Lisa would be off to a new life. Three years ago, Mike's constant traveling began to bore her. The company was doing great, the kids were great, but Lisa felt lonely. Mentally, Lisa realized that Mike wasn't to blame for the loss of her father, but emotionally, Lisa felt abandoned. One night, when Mike wasn't home and the kids were out with friends, Lisa went to a restaurant with some fellow teachers. They were having fun and drank several bottles of wine to keep the fun going. On a whim, they went to a club in the neighborhood. She was dancing with Bob Werner, a fellow teacher, when someone cut in. It was Tony Gillis, an engineer from Mike's company. Tony was an excellent dancer, and Lisa had a great time. When the other teachers left, Lisa stayed to dance some more. When the evening came to an end, Tony called her a cab to take her home. She gave him a warm hug and a peck on the cheek before climbing into the car. A week later, Mike was away on business again, and Tony sent her a text inviting her to another night of dancing. Lisa was thrilled and had another wonderful evening. She met several of Tony's friends, and they welcomed her into their company. Lisa felt more alive than she had since she and Mike were first married. Lisa knew it was harmless and innocent fun, but she had never told Mike about it. It was a little secret, and she considered it her small revenge for Mike leaving her alone so often. Dancing became a regular occurrence when Mike was on a business trip. Josh was a hockey player, so he usually left for practice before 11 p.m. 
m because they didn't get on the ice until 9. He would come home after school, have dinner, and leave before Lisa got home from school, so he never noticed Lisa's absence. Samantha was more difficult. She didn't play sports, so Lisa enrolled her in a series of enrichment classes at the local community college. The classes were on different evenings, so Lisa had no pattern, and she never went out during the weeks Mike was home. Tony was a blessing and became her best friend and confidant. He would sit with her at dinner before their dance nights and listen to her stories about Mike leaving her alone. She would admit with a shy smile that now, during the dance, she looked forward to Mike's absence. Tony was her pillar of support. At first hesitant, Tony began to confess how he felt Mike had mistreated him. Tony told Lisa how Mike ignored good engineering to squeeze more profit out of the business, how Mike sold ideas developed by Tony to clients for huge sums of money and never shared the proceeds with Tony. Lisa was furious on behalf of her new best friend and wanted to confront Mike immediately. Tony calmed her down by explaining that legally, Mike had bound him with a contract that he had signed when he first joined the company. The company owned the intellectual property rights to all employee designs, so nothing forced Mike to share the wealth. Angry that her husband had abandoned her and mistreated her friend, Lisa leaned over and hugged Tony. The embrace turned into a passionate kiss. They quickly left the restaurant and headed straight to Tony's townhouse. That night, they never went to the dance. Lisa refused to call it an affair. She was in love with her true soulmate. Love was tumultuous and fun, and Tony was the man she was meant to be with. A 36-year-old mother of two and a school teacher, she wanted to divorce her husband and start a new life with her true love, her husband's 29-year-old employee. They still went to the dance once a week, and when the kids and Mike weren't home, Lisa often found herself in Tony's bed. However, two things kept her from going through with the divorce. The first was her children. She had seen enough of her students go through divorce, and she didn't want them growing up with two families. Mike was a great father when he was home, and she had enough residual feelings for him to want him to still be with the kids. But she didn't want to give them up. The second suggestion came from Tony. Mike had just promoted Tony to director of engineering with a much bigger salary and a large annual performance-based bonus. Tony wanted to wait a while to establish himself in the position and with clients. Tony said that Lisa could have the company in the divorce, and they would run it together, as they should. Tony argued that the engineering and production staff would support him over Mike, who was considered the absentee boss. Together, the lovers devised a plan for their future. They decided to wait until Samantha graduated from high school before proceeding with their plan. In the meantime, Tony would develop his support among the employees so they would be ready when the time came. Lisa stepped out of the shower, naked. For the first time all day, her muscles were relaxed. The night before, she and Tony had celebrated Sam's departure for school, and her lover had driven her to exhaustion. Sam's early graduation had allowed them to push their plan forward by a full two years, and Tony was overjoyed. The hot water and lotions had worked wonders, and now she was ready to climb into bed. One could only hope that Mike wouldn't want to celebrate with her tonight. Wrapping a large, fluffy towel around her body, Lisa made her way to the large walk-in closet she shared with Mike. She grabbed her robe and turned to leave, but suddenly froze. She turned to look in the closet, all of Mike's things were gone. Lisa ran over to Mike's dresser and saw that the top had been cleaned out. She opened the drawers, they were empty. All of Mike's personal belongings were gone from the bathroom as well. Panic gripped her as she ran down the stairs. The kitchen was as it should be, but in the living room, she noticed that some family photos were missing from the wall, and Mike's movie collection was gone too. Her panic was complete when she reached Mike's home office, which had been completely cleaned out. She sank to the floor as the enormity of the situation hit her. Mike had abandoned her. He had waited until Sam left for school, and then he had left her too. A sudden fear coursed through her, did Mike know about Tony and their plans? Lisa ran back up the stairs to grab her cell phone. She had to call Tony. Running into her room, Lisa noticed an envelope lying on a DVD in the middle of her bed. 
With trembling hands, Lisa picked up the envelope and saw her name written in Mike's handwriting on the front. She opened it and began to read, Lisa, I've loved you since we first met. You were the only one I wanted to spend my whole life with. That this would never be true was my greatest defeat. I couldn't avoid traveling and still keep my business. You never said you were in trouble. Instead, you threw yourself into the arms of that weasel, Tony. I was shocked when I found out you were making love to that snake in the grass. If there was ever an Eddie Haskell comeback, it was Tony. Tony kissed my ass in the office and then stabbed me in the back when I was out. I found out too late, after I promoted the rat, what he was really like. He turned my employees against me, just like he turned my wife into his personal cheater. One missed quote here, one situation there, and the engineering staff was ready to leave in droves. I was an idiot and knew nothing about your affair until it dragged on for a year. When I read the investigator's report, I realized it was too late to save our marriage. There was no turning back after that betrayal. The only thing I agree with you on is waiting for Sam to finish school. Don't worry about telling the kids, they already know. In fact, it was Sam who told me. Our 14-year-old daughter had to tell her father that her mother was a cheater. Remember that sudden diving trip I took with Sam to the Keys? She came home and overheard a rather explicit conversation you were having with your buddy. She collapsed on the floor, and you completely lost sight of her when you left to go meet that asshole. Sam called me to come home. It took me all four days of the weekend to get her under control. Of course, I found out later that you spent most of that time in Tony's bed, whining that I had dumped you. Ever since we got back from that trip, she's been in counseling with me. You know Sam wanted to graduate early. When I decided to stay with you until she graduated, Sam decided to work hard to graduate early. I almost ended it right then and went for a divorce, but Sam demanded that she could do it. I was so proud and shocked at her decision at the same time. We didn't tell Josh until after his graduation. Since then, he has been seeing Sam's counselor. He was shocked that his mother could do such a thing. I had to show him an edited version of my evidence to get him to believe me and Sam. I made him realize that you still loved him and his sister, and that you stayed for them. I think that's the only thing that can save your relationship with him. Good luck with Sam. As for you and your lover's plan to steal my company, you never realized that the company is owned by a family trust. After my father died, his descendants became shareholders, that's our two children and me. It will never be considered part of our joint assets in a divorce. Only the salary I received, my pension, and the house fall into that category. This is why I asked the trust to buy my vet. I can't sell the trust, but I can, with the help of the trustees, sell the company. The trustees consist of Josh, Sam, and me. When the employees of Lars Manufacturing come into the office on Monday, they will be in for a real shock. I would tell you, but why spoil the surprise? I found the letter you planned to deliver to me when I would have been served, as the song goes, I guess you felt you had to make it right. Well, I've got news for you, and you're about to find out it's true. You're gonna have to eat your lunch alone, but I'm already gone. If only you'd talk to me one last time, love, Mike. P.S. The DVD contains some of your greatest hits. Be sure to check out the video in the folder called Tony's Revealed. Lisa collapsed on the bed at the thought of her children knowing what their mother had done and planned to do to their father. Oh God, she cried out, I've lost them all. When the employees of Lars Manufacturing arrived at the office, they were greeted by an email announcing the sale of the company to a much larger firm looking to fill their niche. Mike never showed up at the office. Instead, the new owners and Mike's corporate lawyers showed up. The longtime production and support teams found that their pensions were guaranteed, with at least five more years of service or a buyout equal to the remaining time. The engineers who defected to Tony received no such guarantee. They turned their backs on Tony when his promises of a lucrative future turned to ashes. Tony tried to call Lisa to find out what had happened, but his calls went straight to voicemail. He knew that Mike had been home all weekend, so he had no hope of being able to talk to Lisa. Now, she was avoiding his calls. 
Finally, in a fit of desperation, Tony decided to drive to her place to try to salvage his plans. He drove up to Lisa's driveway and looked for any sign of Mike. Looking into the garage, he saw that the Corvette was gone, that meant Mike wasn't home either. Ringing the doorbell brought no answers, so he just walked in. Lisa, he called out. There was no response. He called out several times, searching the house. Finally, he found Lisa sitting on the bed, watching a video on a flat-screen TV mounted on the wall. Lisa, he asked. Lisa, seemingly oblivious to him, reached out with the remote and pressed play. The TV came to life, and Tony was shocked to hear his own voice coming from the screen. Tony realized it was his own entertainment room. In a few of his friends' voices, he heard, I don't think I could have done it if she wasn't a little careless, and she was instantly mine. I'll take that asshole's company by sleeping with his old lady, so she'll give it to me. Hell, I'll wait a few years and use his daughter too. She's hot. This was met with rude laughter and vulgar suggestions shouted by his friends. Tony remembered when the videotape was recorded, it was eight months ago. That same day, it was announced that the 16-year-old in question would be allowed to graduate from high school that year. Tony was so relieved that his plans had moved a full two years forward. Lisa paused the video. Get out, she said in a dead voice. You cost me everything, and Mike destroyed us both. Lisa, I dash get out, she said in a dead voice. You cost me everything, and Mike destroyed us both. Lisa, I, get out. If my cat had brought his SIG Sour .40 caliber, I would have shot you when you walked through the door and then myself. Just go. Good luck finding a job in this area. Mike will take care of it. Lisa then turned and faced the wall. A few minutes, or hours later, when she turned around he was gone. She never saw him again. Lisa was served on Tuesday. She wasn't surprised to see that Mike was completely fair in his divorce proposal, 50-50, with her keeping the $1.2 million house and Mike taking most of their long-term investments. A lump sum balance between the current value of his pension and her pension from the school district and education trust covered the children's tuition and expenses. But for that fairness, there would be no child support and no other contact. In return, the videotapes would never see the light of day. Mike would have full custody of Sam, but she would be in college most of the year, so it was almost a moot point. However, a personal note from Sam stated that she refused to be forced to spend the next two years of school vacation with my mom and her boyfriend. Reading words like that, written in her sweet daughter's handwriting, was even worse than those damned videos. What had she done? The end. If it were up to you, what approach would you choose? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below.